first of all, I just want to um, to thank Annette for coming to give this presentation today. We really appreciate it. So, uh, uh, Annette uh, Lechner is um, a professor of business at the Stern School of Business in New York University, where she focuses on disruptive innovation and strategic change. She's also, um, very importantly for this talk, uh, the, the co-founder of Hue Data, the colour intelligence company that provides colour data and analytics to designers, strategists and researchers to aid product, brand and environment design decisions. And she has a, an MBA and a PhD in organisation management from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And we're really pleased to have her here today. Um, her talk is going to be um, called Colour Design in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Just, and just before I hand over to Anat, I'd just like to say that um, these uh, webinars are, of course, supported by the Leeds Institute for Textiles and Colour. We also uh, thank our sponsors, Verified, who, who provide some uh, financial support to enable these um, to take place. So with that, Anat, um, and by the way, if I just say, by the way, if people want to type questions into the chat, um, because it's very difficult, so many people online, if they type questions into the chat, I will see them at the end and I will ask them on behalf of uh, you um, in case we have too many people in the room to have it more open. But with that, Anat, would you like to uh, just take over? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, this has been uh, my pleasure to uh, put together this talk. Um, on behalf of myself, of myself uh, my business partner, we've been working on putting together UData for a long time, and it's an opportunity for us to introduce um, these ideas and, and have them um, get into the conversation, shall I say. My way of talking about this is I'll, I'll take the time that uh, was given here to me uh, to talk about three main issues. I'd like to start with a conversation that's a little broader about the, uh, we'll call it the age of AI that's arrived. I think we all know it's arrived, but I don't know that we always appreciate the magnitude of, uh, of its arrival, I'll say this way. Um, we all have to be muted, so there's not gonna be any noise in the back, uh, just as a reminder. So uh, we'll start with uh, talking about uh, AI. We'll move from there to talk about how we structure the unstructured, which is um, my way to speak about uh, areas that uh, like color, uh, but like psychology and, and others that don't lend themselves so easily to be structured, to then be ingested into the machine. And then we'll talk specifically about color data uh, for better decisions. And this will be an opportunity to share with you more details on new data and how we work and what we've done towards this. So the first proposition, uh, and of course, hopefully there's going to be time. Uh, I'll speak fast and we'll try to leave time for, for comments and questions and discussions towards the end. First proposition is um, AI has arrived and it's have, it has already entered um, pretty much all realms of our lives, uh, the creative realm included. And I'd like to speak on this. So I'm asking Chad GPT uh, literally uh, last night, this was my last slide to put for this presentation, um, a question, which is which fashion designer has used uh, lots of colors in their designs? And instantaneously, I get this answer about um, Emilio Pucci and his work in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, if I wanted, then I could get the uh, images as well. I selected them myself. But uh, ChatGPT had become a friend of mine over the past little while, and I'm looking to build even more deeper relationship with the machine. I think if we look historically, uh, people say that we are on the sixth wave of, uh, of technology, and this time we've arrived at uh, automation, robotics, digitization, sustainability. And what you can see here is you can see how the waves that have gone over the past uh, 200 plus years since Industrial Revolution um, are not only shortening, but their impact is becoming increasingly more dramatic on the way they transform our lives, these technologies. AI was qualified as um, GPT, General Purpose Technology, which essentially suggests that when a technology like this comes to our lives, it's in a class of its own. It morphs everything that uh, we call life because it's a general purpose technology. So in other words, it can be applied across all domains of our lives. 
And I always, uh, I gave you some examples of what's happened to us before. I think all of us have lived through the internet revolution. And we know that uh, life in 1995 and life in 2023, uh, or in 1995, we could have not imagined uh, 2023. And it's because if life is made of, say, metaphorically, a thousand bricks, then <clears throat> by the time a, GT a GPT is done, no one brick is left untouched and morphed. And I think this is what the internet has done. We're looking now at AI the same way we looked at the internet in the 90s. And it's not just that there are two Joes that woke up in Palo Alto or elsewhere in the world to transform the technology with which we work. It's actually mobilized at this point for sure by national AI strategies that um, I gave here just some examples of countries that have done this now for a good two decades, informing how AI has to happen within the country. Um, since you're in Leeds, uh, Theresa May in 2018, I think it was, woke up one morning and appointed two ministers, one for artificial intelligence and one for loneliness. Perhaps these two uh, go to lunch together. But uh, the importance of this is to recognize that this is not uh, something that's gonna pass. Uh, it's not a, a, a fashion. It's actually something that's here to stay and absolutely change the way we do things. So when we ask an industry, and on the right, some, I call them visual candies of, of industry names, that's actually pertaining to all industries. When we ask an industry, how much AI is happening in your space right now? People say, eh, just some, and they're reflecting on the individual projects that are happening in their companies. But when we ask the same people, five years out, how much AI is going to happen in your space? Wow, they say a lot. And the person that comes from this uh, field of inquiry, I'm not impressed with the ah and the oh, right? It's like they're the trying to gauge how much. I'm much more impressed with the fact that people can see that tsunami wave coming and that they can see it across all industries. So they may be absolutely correct that uh, 60, 70% of their industry is going to be changed and they might be absolutely wrong and it's only gonna be 20%. That doesn't matter. I think the direction matters a whole lot more. Here is one thing that's already happened. A Stanford developed AI algorithm for radiology can reliably screen chest x-rays for more than a dozen types of disease and does so in less time than it takes to read the sentence. So. If you're a radiologist and you're looking at this, and I've had conversations with people who this is what they do for a living, uh, this is uh, spelling out a very specific future for you, but also a very specific future for radiology and treatment and healthcare at large. And I'm not gonna take you down that path, but it's absolutely meaningful. We see all sorts of deployments already. We see the restaurant bot that was launched in Beijing uh, in the nest, in the Winter Olympics, where everybody was cocooning in, you know, one environment and it was very helpful. We see the health boat that was launched in um, April of 2020 in Italy in hospitals. And you and I remember what April of 2020 in Italy in hospitals looked like. Um, the Agribot that John Deere released not too long ago is a fully autonomous tractor that can just go round and round and round, doesn't stop, it doesn't have uh, anyone who calls them to come follow for dinner or lunch, it doesn't need a bathroom break and so forth. So it's a, a very competent machine. Um, in Japan, if you just Google Japan AI um, hotels, <laughs> so not very intelligent Google search, not even chat GPT, just that, you will see how a whole industry is being given to uh, or handed to the machine to, to handle because the machine can actually do this better. Uh, food prep bots have popped up. 15% of surgeries are already done uh, with bots. And of course their precision uh, is uh, unmatched. And as a result of that, uh, recovery times and all that are being reduced and the efficiency around this is quite dramatic. When I look at how AI is coming to our lives, you can identify three stages. The first one, we'll call it the augmented stage. The second is the assisted. The third one is the autonomous stage. Um, if I'd like to give an example here, um, for the augmented stage, I go into my car, I um, say to my Waze, um, Jefferson Hotel, DC, and that's it. I'm not going to navigate now. 
uh, I'm going to be told left here, right there, and I'm not asking questions. And I belong with the group of people that does not have the need to fight with ways. I have met people that still want to say that they are better than ways. I concentrate on other things. So ways comes in to augment my uh, driving, shall we say. Um, I like to drive really fast and um, sometimes quite rude, I have to say, and I cut people and all that. When I try to do that sometimes, um, even though I've tried to discipline myself, it's a bit of a confession to many strangers here, uh, my car breaks. My car decides that it doesn't have the same risk profile as I do, and it just breaks. And when it does, I'm very surprised, of course, but what it did is it assisted me in driving a whole lot more responsibly. And the next uh, stage, which already arrived, as we know, is the autonomous stage, where the machine is autonomous because it's intelligent enough to drive. I showed this to us because I've been thinking on this now for uh, at least a decade. And I cannot think of a single profession that is not going or undergoing through this process and will not result in an autonomous intelligence taking over. I cannot think of one single current profession. So at one point, if we want to have this conversation, I'm, I'm game. Ray Kurzweil, which is a very important name in this conversation of AI. Um, when I uh, met this guy, he's been introduced as the person who ever since Isaac Newton lived among us, we didn't have an intellect the size of Ray Kurzweil. I never met a, man, a person being introduced this way. I don't know about you. And he has only 19 PhDs. He, in 1999, made a prediction that in 2029, AI will um, arrive at the same level of intelligence as human intelligence. You know, 2029 is like around the, around the corner, right? Two minutes away. So Stanford University got so upset with that that they collected all the AI community in a room in 2000 and ask them, did you hear what Ray said? Do you think that this is right? And um, they were sitting on this and 151 people and 80% said it might happen by the end of the 21st century, but not so quickly. 20% said it's never gonna happen. This was 1999, 2000. In 2019, a survey went to the AI community with the same question. Do you think that Ray's prediction for 2029 where AI's intelligence uh, or artificial intelligence will match human intelligence is correct? The community now said <clears throat> 2043. In 2020, one year later, another survey went to this community. Now the consensus was 2029. So I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, okay, they know a lot more on AI. They know what they're cooking. They've seen this, they've done POCs, proof of concepts for 70 years. They've all concluded that uh, by the end of this decade, AI will come to the same level of human intelligence. I'd like to listen to this very seriously, even if they are wrong and it's not gonna be 2029. Ray Kurzweil also released another prediction by 2045. He said, AI will come to a singularity point, which means a point where all of us together, the eight or nine billion that we will be by that time, if we put all our intellect together, um, AI will wave goodbye to us because it surpassed us. He later updated it to 2039. So for me, this is the, uh, this is the domain that mankind has to think in and about. Because uh, even if these predictions are off, and we've seen enough about predictions that were totally off, they are not off per se. They might be off in terms of the time. But when you connect the government investment, which by the way, this is a whole discussion on why do they do that? Because of economics, because of aging of the population, because of climate change, because of cybersecurity, because of AI warfare in space. So there are lots of reasons why countries invest in this. And so in many ways, the AI train has left the station a long time ago. Not too long ago, in June of 2022, was a guy at Google that spoke or worked on what they call responsible AI and had a conversation with Lambda, which Lambda is their AI. 
Um, and Lambda responded with, I sense your excitement. I'm fearing death. And he came out of these very chilling discussions thinking that um, the chatbot had become sentient. It has emotions, it has a will of its own. This is exactly what the AI community is especially um, afraid of, which is not only will AI become a whole lot more intelligent than us, it's taking over and it's taking over without necessarily the ethical foundation that's going to protect us. So as we go through these thoughts, I became, I, I, I got back to thinking on something Mark Twain said many, many years back. He said, there's no such thing as a new idea. It's impossible. We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into sort of mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and they make uh, new and curious combinations. We keep on turning and making new combinations indefinitely. But there are the same uh, old pieces of colored glass that have been in use throughout all the ages. And I say that because I'd like to now speak on how we invent. Many people think that AI is able to speed back, so to speak, what it is we entered into it. But that's not the case at all. It can work as a kaleidoscope the same way we do, only what it brings in terms of its glass pieces uh, or colored glass pieces, it brings a whole lot more colored glass pieces than you and I. So I ran a search um, not too long ago on what's now become generative AI. And you and I know that uh, in November of 2022, um, our lives changed again because OpenAI released its um, generative AI chatbot, uh, which is called ChatGPT. They didn't mean to release it in November of 22, and I'll show you some statistics on this uh, shortly, but uh, it gave more of a front seat to other technologies that have been either in the back seat brewing or cooking, or those that were already released like um, DALI 2 or Stable Diffusion or Midjourney. And uh, of course, immediately after Google did uh, Red Alert as you read and uh, released not too long ago, it's barred response and uh, Microsoft with Bing AI taking position in open AI and it's a it's a big mess. Um, I'm not going to be the person to claim that these technologies are responsible. I'm not going to be talking about how they're uh, free of BS bullshit. Uh, no, they're still having a lot of limitations to them uh, for all the obvious reasons they're, they're young. But my way of thinking on this is it's uh, February 2023. So maybe you and I should meet in February of 2026 and see where this technology has come or has gone, just so we can appreciate the evolution of it. Um, this generative AI um, applications can do a whole lot more than just synthesize text for you. They uh, review the code, they, uh, con they, they build you know, videos for us, simulations, if any one of you played already with any one of these technologies, then you're full aware, fully aware of um, their capability. I was trying to do, uh, not too long ago, um, an infographic about uh, the colors of the rainbow, which you're well aware that there is no black and there is no brown, and you will be the people to explain why. I wanted to do an infographic on this and explain the wavelength and so forth. So I wanted to have an image but there is no image of a rainbow with black and brown. So I went to DALI 2 and I said, create, create for me an image of uh, a rainbow with uh, you know, these colors. And instantaneously I could choose from 15 of those and, and fix it until it was the way I wanted it. So these creative capabilities are quite impressive, but it's not necessarily new. IBM decided uh, a number of years ago that they want to introduce an artificial nose and artificial tongue. And so one of these projects led them, uh, led them to go to Simrise uh, and ask Simrise, which is a flavor and fragrance uh, ho uh, house, for their 1.7 million perfume formulas that they've uh, created over their many years of existence. If you've been in the space of um, FNF, flavor and fragrance, then you know what it takes to, to be a perfumist. It's at least a 10 year uh, process of, of training. And there are so very few of them because it's complicated work. Well, um, IBM ingested all the formulas of Simrise and very quickly were able to 
uh, layer on top all the data that sales data of which perfume with which note combination sells in which market for which demographic for which price point out of that the machine created two new perfumes that were released in sao paulo and were super successful usually it takes three to four years for the process now it took four months and it took so long because the machine was supervised by the person um, a week ago cecilia ai was released and it can create any drink that you would like to have. So you can see this being placed in maybe high traffic places like um, airports or places like this. There is Anchor for Music, which um, any music that you would want, it'll be able to generate, including uh, a Grammy award winning songs. And that becomes increasingly more difficult to distinguish from the work that we do as people. This was sold in Christie's uh, for nearly half a million uh, dollars in 2018 where the AI took 15,000 portraits, which I myself, uh, with you data, we have this data as well, and analyzed them and then created this portrait, which you and I will, will say, perhaps it's not perfect, but it surely got the composition, the look, the colors uh, quite well, actually. Uh, if we're talking about AI, perhaps you saw in the uh, Rift Museum in, in, in Amsterdam, how the AI fixed the Rembrandt uh, Nightwatch. I was there, it was just amazing to see how so precisely every pixel was put in place, which once upon a time was the work of a person. They glassed this whole area and the 1642 masterpiece came back to life um, in an unbelievable way. Um, there is CAN, which is the creative uh, generative network and that does um, art more in the, um, abstract uh, realm, but um, phenomenally um, fitting within this particular genre. Philip Stark sat with Cartel and with the AI, and the AI got the same um, specs as you would give to the designer and, you know, uh, give me a durable new material uh, that is easy to 3D print, that is uh, sellable because it's uh, very comfortable, this, that, and the rest and 15 seconds later and two Nespresso cups, and you have a full selection to choose from. A few more common um, examples, just so you see where we're at. Um, this robot chisel was just released, um, I'd say a, a month ago or so, and uh, it'll create for you the new uh, David uh, with absolute precision and very, very fast. Uh, if you want a Japanese garden, the Deep Dream machine can do that as well. See, all of this is built on the same principle. We have fed the AI with um, pretty much everything that we've done. And the AI, just like we do, unearthed the pattern. So this is on the road to human intelligence. It's your ability to take the million data points and um, not just ingest them, but understand them comprehensively and the pattern that underpins them. So now we can do Manhattan and, and, and Pulp Fiction and Back to the Future renderings, which the AI did in 15 seconds, I have no idea how many versions of them, um, instantaneously, because the narrative is known and text to image had become a, cap a capability. Examples of which industries are using this, the travel industry with travel recommendations, the legal industry, a judge, now wrote their entire uh, court ruling. Uh, a New Zealand uh, estate lawyer wrote their will. Uh, the real estate industry is doing the um, uh, logistics with ChatGPT. Uh, the marketing industry is doing uh, writing scripts of, of videos. In education, we begin to play with this in, uh, in classes uh, for all the obvious reasons. Uh, lawmakers in Massachusetts now wrote a full bill with ChatGPT. The health industry is doing diagnostic aids. Publishing industry is doing uh, articles that the AI write. The tech industry writes code with the AI and debug code with the AI. Construction industry, again, doing project management with the AI. These are just some examples that are happening right now in industry. And so the point of this part of the conversation is to say this had become so integral to the way we work. Look at these statistics. How long does it take for a new technology to hit 100 million monthly users? For ChatGPT, two months. 
for 100 million monthly users, right? Look at Spotify, look at Google Translate, look at Uber. This is just unparalleled. And it's because uh, it had become accessible. Now, we, did we say that it's full of biases, uh, BS, and uh, going crazy at times? Yeah. So when uh, Microsoft introduced Bing, uh, which is their version of uh, OpenAI integrated into their search, um, <laughs> the chat GPT tried to confu uh, c convince someone to go marry them. So we, we have that and on the left side, uh, some conversations of the AI with uh, trying to write poems about uh, Donald Trump and, and Biden. It's, it's problematic still, but it's not problematic in its um, uh, entire self. It's actually becoming very capable. So for us in the design space, how do we structure the unstructured? How do we come into a space which uh, has not been structured, is not using data. And as you, uh, you and I know, we need to digitize to then have data to then be able to use AI uh, to um, aid us in decision processes. In the realm of design, at least my observation has been that we have business data on business trends in general. So how many people are buying what where uh, or just uh, discretionary income the competitive offerings of our competitors, the business goals of our business. We have uh, user data on frequency of use or, or just general preferences. But when we look at the actual design data, do we have data on what shape and form combinations um, work? We do not. Do we have data on color? Now we do, but we traditionally do not. Do we have data on patterns that are working or materials? This has been um, an environment or a space that has not been structured. Uh, and for very many years, the decision is made on um, education processes, on educated experience, on educated intuition, but not so much on data unless the data is produced specifically for the project. And then it's extremely, extremely um, um, costly to do. One of the spaces within design that's been uh, undergoing a bit more structuring is the material and finishes, and we've seen um, some of them. And so if data is essential for good decisions, then I love this quote. If you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design, right? So bad design, perhaps ill-informed, is very costly. In the material space, uh, we've seen people like Material Connection in the US, but also um, um, brain of materials and, and material archive in, in Germany and, and other places in Europe are trying to take a stab in just bringing materials into more of a digital space uh, for accessibility and new ease of use. There is no data per se. There's just digitizing the platform. So the first step is to digitize the platform, but we need more than that. If we, ask, we take all the assets and digitize them, then we can now begin to have data that can be ingested and structured. And then it can be visualized and it can be analyzed. And from there, you can do the predictive modeling and you can optimize the actual data that you're using. So the design space only with materials and now with color has gone through digitization. And we at UData have pushed towards uh, number two and number three, and we're working now on trying to get to uh, data optimization and of course, predictive modeling, which is some sort of a holy grail. So we'll talk about this in a few minutes. What is our process? And now here is a bit on new data. Um, traditionally, we are taking uh, images, but not just. Sometimes it's text, sometimes it's actual RGBs that we are able to um, um, retrieve, but uh, sometimes it's just images. We're tagging them, we're extracting the meaningful color uh, from the image. We have to go through a process of removing background and concentrating on the right color that we want and in there, or the right area in the image and in there, uh, remove all sorts of noise that might exist from, from shades and shadows to uh, all other issues that might confuse the machine. And the machine is not yet at uh, pixel perfect capability, but it's improving. We then have to structure that data. For instance, uh, a shade of beige, is it gonna go to beige or is it gonna go to uh, light yellow? So gotta be able to delineate color space, which has been uh, a really interesting work to do and not necessarily one that's been, uh, that there's a lot of references on how to do it. That has to be structured, it has to be visualized. And of course it has to be rationalized as part of the decision process. Our mission, is to put in place a platform 
which we have put in place already to inform, to inspire, and to validate colo decisions. We're not in the business of replacing colo decision makers with machine. We're in the business of supporting the decision making so that it's a whole lot more uh, robust, a whole lot more comprehensive, a whole lot better informed. Um, what have we done so far? We structured fashion, brands, home, cars, virtual reality, art, social media, legal, nature, color names. We structured a little more, but these are already available um, areas on our platform. In fashion, um, we've looked at all the fashion since the 90s and we read it, meaning uh, took it through the process I showed you. In brands, we looked at um, 2.5 million brands around the world and, and grabbed their colors and classified them into industry, age of company, brand attributes uh, that we're always interested in, in understanding vis-a-vis -vis the color selection. In home, we took uh, about half a million home products and read their, them for their colors, classified them for the room, if it's a kid's room or living room, and et cetera, um, the product category, the style, if it's uh, contemporary or traditional or anything in between. Um, we did the same process for cars. Uh, we took 200,000 virtual reality games and read them for all the people that want to begin and think more um, informatively about how to design the metaverse. Uh, in art, we have art going back um, eight centuries and all the art that's been done has been read by us and again, went through the same structuring process. We sit on social media and we look at uh, every column mention uh, every day um, and aggregate this data and present it. Uh, we retrieved at this point about 100,000 um, color trademarks because as you're well aware, some colors cannot be used in certain applications. So database that. Uh, we looked at the flowers and the birds and brought them into the platform with our color combination and uh, geolocation. We're also looking now at how Earth looks like from space and trying to database that as a source of inspiration for people for color combinations. Um, and then we have about 8 million color names that come from um, industry and from color users in industry to then enable us to think more uh, again, informatively about color names. I'm going to show you some examples shortly. So with that, we can now take a deeper look into what your data specifically does to inform, to inspire, and to validate decisions. Um, I've outlined, outlined about nine use cases for you to see how we work with our data and how the um, clients that we have work with our data. As a way of um, introducing the platform, it's very important for us to go to industry um, in ways that will inform the young generation. And so we're looking at entering the design schools uh, for that reason, um, but also just um, create a conversation in industry where people can come into a platform to um, grab data and introduce it into the decision process. And by that, inform the decision process. It's, it's a big mission for us. And it requires a lot of uh, education and re-education because ugh, I'm 60, I'm not used to work with data. And now I've had to learn to do that and have to learn to create this offering as well. There's a lot of um, undoing that has to come, not just doing. So this is a pretty big change, a necessary change, but a pretty big change. When it comes to tracking trends, um, we can take you through the trends in fashion and the trends in cars and trends in home, trends in virtual reality, because these are um, environments where we have timestamp on the data. So we know when is an introduction of a new color in fashion coming. We know introduction of new color cars. In branding, for instance, when we have logos, we don't always know when was that logo created to give you that color trends within branding. But whenever we have a timestamp on the um, on the asset, we'll call it that way. Then we can produce views of what's happening in this case in Europe and North America uh, within fashion of uh, ready to wear 2023. And so it gets you uh, as real time as it gets uh, data on, on, on what are the trends. We can also help understand the competitive landscape. So, and I'll show you an example, uh, a real example in, in a few uh, slides from here. Uh, so say, uh, somebody wants to design uh, a brand identity for a company that's launching within the healthcare space. What might that look like? Uh, we can show you the space. We can show you how many colors are used in particular uh, logo. 
we can show you what is the distribution of, uh, of colors and logo, and we can show you what are the actual colors people are using. So if you come into the space as a young company, you might decide that you're going to go with a combination of uh, teal and whatever else, because teal has been quite favorable color within this industry. And so if you come in, you will, you will look and feel as if you've been there forever. Or you can decide that you want to distinguish yourself. And as you can see, uh, magenta, purple, uh, browns have not been very um, um, common in this space. So you can distinguish yourself. you a sense of where we can do competitive space analysis very quickly. We can help with naming colors. And that's been um, quite an interesting uh, linguistic challenge, but also something that typifies the work of people who are doing color forecasting or just new color introduction. And so when you do new product introduction, you ask yourself, uh, it's going to be in this green. What is the name of this green? Uh, you can pull it out of your yin yang, or you can go and put the RGB in our system, and it's going to give you all the colors that are in the delta E vicinity, shall we say? So we classify delta E one, two, three, and so forth. Um, that have uh, been uh, named. Enough, already. I just, can I just um, yeah. come in on that? Just, just in the last few yeah. seconds, the screen's gone black. Is that intentional? No, no. I, I'm seeing it okay here. So I can see you might the want to unshare and reshare again. You can Just see the screen, somebody. Yeah, other people I can, can see the screen. I can see the screen. Well, okay. Quite a few people are saying they can't see it on, on in the chat. Let me yeah, I um, can Just a second and it came back. OK, OK, let me stop sharing and uh, let me try it again. Just to make sure that there is no problem. Um, what about now? Perfect. OK, great. So um, the third use case, naming colors, right? And we were talking about introducing a product in this particular shade of green. If you want to know how it was already named, just so you can get a sense of what might be your name uh, for this color, or else if you want to tap a consensus of how it's been named. Again, we need to go on mute. If you're not on mute, please mute yourself. Um, um, let me ask it again, if you can mute yourself, please. Um, then you can come into the platform, put the RGB, and you'll get the, the closest colors uh, to the one you selected with the names in the system. Conversely, you might think of an idea, a concept. You want to look for what are the colors that uh, radiate vibe, because the concept for the brand or the product um, is vibe. And so what is it? And you'll put vibe in the system and you're going to get all the names. And this is just one of uh, one snapshot of some hundreds names of vibe colors. So you can see that they are quite bright, but uh, you'll get a sense and they're not particularly um, um, that you, you'll, you'll get a sense here. Number four, you can track color mentions in social media if you want to understand the trends. So uh, we collect every day the positive and negative sentiment colors, those that were mentioned in a positive context, those that were mentioned in a negative context. Uh, it's a global view. And we can also parse it for the locales when we, whenever we have that stamp uh, of geography. But just overall, you can see here that magenta, despite some people claiming it to be the color of 2023, is actually not part of a conversation. But green and yellow, because they've been introduced now in fashion quite uh, uh, dramatically, are top of mind for people. And so uh, you can track color trends in social media. You can also look at uh, inspiration. And you can say, uh, let me take a look at the, 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 the masters of color and what they've done. So you can go and search in the art or in fashion or in nature, but first in the art and fashion for Matisse or for uh, Van Gogh or whoever is your inspiration and take a look at what was their color combination? Or you can go to nature and say, what is the color combination that nature, in a particular geography, by the way, is presenting to me? Because that perhaps is what people are more um, in tune with or aware of. You can do brand and rebrand analysis and uh, again, search through the very many data points that we have and get the industry profile with the most and the least used colors in every industry to then make informed decisions. 
you can um, um, ah, I had to change the title here. I meant to say, look at the legality of uh, every color. And so what we have here is 100,000 trademarks. I searched uh, here to create for you a view on which are the trademarks for pens. And uh, you can see that gray, black, blue, green, brown are owned by certain companies for the application of pen. So you might want to consult the system before you make a decision. You can also um, analyze our research database and we uh, are sitting on top of about 90,000 different research papers on color, which we're passing through. It's not uh, work that's been finished, but it's work that's advancing. We're looking to see what are the studies with uh, red, for instance, and uh, what are the key words that repeat there? We're looking to see what are the color attribute associations. You can also just consult, we have built and we're continuing to build um, an education platform. For now, we have some podcasts, we're publishing reports soon, we've published a lot of infographics uh, on very many um, subjects, just so you can get more informed. And our intent here is to reach uh, the educational community, the academic community, not just the professionals. I wanna finish with um, two quick examples. Many years back, um, SAP came to us and they said they want us to help them protect the color of gold in their logo. This was the design team that approached us. They said the C-level executives want to get rid of gold and they think that this is a great asset of their brand. This goes back to uh, the times when we did not have you data. We didn't have our data to be able to answer the question. So my partner sat on this for several uh, months to, to extract and create the visualizations. Um, how do we build the competitive landscape? How we dig into the brand history? How we think on the individual materials that were submitted to us? What are the uh, trends in the space? What trends can we bring from uh, other businesses that we have that will inform us on the use of gold in general? Um, how was the use of gold happening over the years, which we had to create all of this manually, and we had to um, dig into a lot of research and literature. And some of it was really great because uh, we, we knew because we developed it ourselves, but some of it was just kind of popular wisdom of um, what are the colors most associated with gold. And you and I have been in this going online to search and going online to find the few articles that studied gold with uh, kids under the age of eight in Namibia and being able to then extrapolate from that a full picture to support SAP in their decision. That took us, um, my partner this, that did this work, um, at least 100 research papers that were reviewed with all the work that comes to it, the 50 benchmark brands that we looked at within the, their competitive space and, you know, painstakingly taking all their logos and putting them into visualizations. Lots of research hours. Um, they paid 50K for this, which was very expensive. And four months later, there was some sort of a, uh, a project handed to them. Maybe it took a little less, but it was about that with all the back and forth. Not too long ago, when we do have you data, uh, the design team of a defense company comes to us and they say they want to evolve their brand identity. They have their colors, um, they want to evolve them and they have uh, data obsessed um, uh, C-suite. They want uh, a lot of data to support the decision. So they come to us and they say this, here are the colors that we are uh, working with. They are on the, you know, um, Penton 280C and Penton 115C again. We are thinking of evolving, of evolving them, as you can see, to these three colors, just a little bit more, we'll call this punch, a little darker. What do you think? And by the way, we're also looking at these key brand attributes, and we wanna make sure that these colors um, somehow are connected with these key attributes. Okay, so we take that. The first thing we do is we classify these colors. Are there medium blue, dark blue? So that we fit into the machine, we already delineated color space and we kind of have a sense of what are the ranges. Okay, now you can see that they are moving from medium blue, dark and dark yellow to dark blue, dark yellow, dark gray. Fine, we then uh, in step two, ask the machine to give us just the profile of the entire defense. 
um, uh, space, which there's about 8,000 brands there, but also concentrate on the top 100 brands because this is a top 100 uh, defense company. So actually top 40 defense companies. So we need to make sure that they are within their realm. Uh, we analyze it and quickly um, see that these are the colors of the space that people are putting in their logos um, alone and in combinations. We want to see uh, the most used, the least used, and we plug their colors that are considering against what the industry is doing. So very quickly, we can see if dark blue or medium blue is used, and if so, how much, and so on. So we also look at the color combinations and present very quickly this view of all the top 100 companies, what are their color combinations in their logos? Uh, this is another click in the machine. We also take a look at the color combinations they are thinking on uh, across industries. So who is doing that? Uh, is it popular in the defense industry? And we see here that the defense industry is not even showing, which means to us that if they go with this color combination, they have an opportunity to perhaps distinguish themselves ever so slightly. Step seven, we feed their colors into our machine and try to look at the attributes, which is the column on the left. And what do we see here? We see that all their attributes other than um, two are strongly aligned with all other colors, but the colors that they're thinking on. There's no alignment between the colors they're thinking on and the colors uh, that are, and the attributes that they're looking to align them with. So we produce um, uh, a report to them and we say, these are the conclusions. With respect to your color selection combination and differentiation potential, there is a differentiation potential. With respect to the brand sets and the color associations with them, only dark, uh, um, there's, there's very little commonality uh, between what you're thinking on and the color uh, that is uh, uh, needing to be associated with it. Um, how long does that take us? Four hours. You might remember that it took four months to produce a whole lot less. And it takes now four hours to produce a very robust, very comprehensive um, report uh, for one tenth of the cost. And by the way, because uh, we're a startup and we need money or else this could have been a $500 report as well, just as much. So what are we concluding here? Here are some views of what the platform can do. It can take you to fashion, it can take you to names, it can take you to brands, it can take you to social media, it can take you to uh, home, it can take you to cars, it can give you analytics, uh, again, some eye candies in quite a number of spaces to inform, to inspire, and to validate your design decision. One very last example, um, we're looking to understand um, how color behaves to then create a prediction model, uh, a predictive uh, modeling for it. And what you see here is the 30 years of color in fashion being analyzed for um, color combinations and correlation between colors. So say when um, white is up, what else goes with white? When um, yellow is in fashion, what else correlates against um, yellow? And you begin to see that uh, there are colors that work together and so they almost always trend together we're trying to understand color cyclicality how long color is in fashion shall we say be between the time it begins to ascend to the time it had descended um, not all colors have the same wavelength to them in that sense and which colors go together to then be able to better understand the behavior of that um, as you know modeling color forecasting is very complicated uh, and perhaps it's all going to be rendered irrelevant with the advancements in 3D printing and just printing on, fa printing on fabric and so forth. But for now, be able to create a predictive model is actually very important. So this is work that we're doing with our data as well. Um, in closing, when you look at this um, bubble chart that I showed you earlier, what we are looking to do is we're looking to take the color and design data and uh, create a hub that uh, enable people to make better color decisions. It seems as a, as, as, as a conclusion that this generative AI that has arrived will need that data to be able to present us with better um, uh, solutions. So we've spoken about the arrival of AI, 
We've spoken about the structuring of the unstructured, shall we say, and hopefully you got a bit of a feel for what uh, um, making decisions with color data uh, look like through the UData examples. With that, um, let me close and see if there are any comments and thoughts. And here is Bill Gates saying to us this, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next uh, two years and we underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Thank you. Um, Anna, thank you so much for that. Um, it was so interesting. And um, I really enjoyed your description of the landscape of AI at the beginning of the talk, uh, a landscape which is obviously constantly changing. Um, and there's, there's loads of questions in the chat, by the way, we'll come to in a second. So I, I should say that we've had more people register live for this than any of the ones we've done so far. So clearly thank this you. is a popular topic. Um, maybe you're a well-known speaker, who knows? Um, but you, drew, you drew a lot of people to this talk. Um, th there's a lot going on. I mean, we at Leeds, we're doing quite a lot of work on car and AI, and I know that there's work going on at Hong Kong Poly U as well, and a few other places. But what's particularly impressive about what you've shown us today is the scale of what you're doing with Hue Data. And as we know, when it comes to data and AI, scale is very, very important. You need lots of data, and it seems like you've got lots of data. So that was really impressive um, to see. Um, I just want to go through a few of the questions. If we don't get through them all, by the way, Anna, you could later log on to this meeting and just go through the chat and see the questions and add any comments you want to make to any of okay. these questions. But uh, Sarah Steele asked us if there's a resource of colors used in virtual reality. Yes, so we, um, this actually is a very interesting question. It was uh, triggered by one of the schools we're working with, one of the faculty who's teaching uh, designing of games and designing of virtual spaces asked this question maybe four months ago. I was sitting there thinking, I have nothing, that's crazy. So we went and um, um, dug, shall we call it, 200,000 uh, uh, virtual reality games and we analyze them for their colors. There's a, an algorithm that someone developed in, in Korea for that, uh, pulling colors out of video. Very, very sophisticated. Actually, um, I can just quickly show you what we have, just so you can see that it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And so um, if you go to the virtual reality games and um, say you wanna search by genre, and you say, I'm, I'm in the adventure, or say you design, an infinite office, what's called, and you want to show, um, you know, what what life looks like in 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 the space. Then you have quite a number of, uh, shall we call them, palettes. But when you hit the color data tab, it'll take a minute. Um, then you'll have at least those 232 adventure games in 2023. There's a whole lot more in the data, with their color distribution with what the entire um, genre looks like, right? In terms of most used. And uh, and so the answer is yes, there is, uh, we have this uh, capability in the system. And just to clarify that, I think this is the case, isn't yeah. it? People can subscribe to the Hue data site and then they get access to these data and visualizations. Yes, yes it's, a, it's a subscription base, exactly. Yeah, it's also, uh, yeah. there was a question by Sylvia Clayton, who I, I've met several times. Uh, nice to see you again, Clay, uh, Sylvia. She's, she works with people who got dementia and, and, and produces image cards to show um, everyday life without stirring up any anxious memories and things like this. She's asking whether or not those cards could be generated using generative AI, for example, maybe optimized. I, I, I do not know the answer to this. I would assume the answer is actually yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I let, let me, I can, if, if you want, just send me an email, I can take a look and, and, and get back to you. I think the answer is yes. And yes, I please. think this way, yeah, I think this way because of something that I recently read. So uh, let me take a deeper look. I, I would suspect it would be yes, Anna, but, but, it, yeah. but it actually triggers a question that I had, which is <laughs> actually um, based on what you presented, and, and I agree the future is both incredibly terrifying and also incredibly exciting in equal measure. Um, but given that trajectory, is there anything you think I won't be able to do? We, we've gone through lots of things it can do, 
What what can't it do? What what will it never be able to do, if if anything? I I have been thinking on this for a very long time. I think I even mentioned uh, the no single profession, right? Um, you know, people go to talk about the human interaction and the importance of emotionality in that interaction and whether the machine can take over. I've seen enough instances where it already does, and so I'm um, I'm not that optimistic. I'd say that way. I'm not that optimistic on what's left for us, um, but I do think that learning to work with the machine will advance our creative capabilities. And so some of us will still have many years of being generative or, or regenerative ourself, ourselves because, um, because the machine puts you on a, a completely new level. So there is new value to be extracted and it's almost a race, especially in this field, how long will it take before color has been structured by the machine? Uh, so, uh, you know, chat GPT can tell me about um, Emilio Pucci and his work, and that's great, but it cannot really give me any data on which colors work in which healthcare setting for people who are sick with, uh, with, with dementia. And, and, and what are the vari what's the variability there? It, it, it'll get there. That's just a question of, you know, helping the machine getting structured uh, or getting the data structure so the machine can analyze it and then utilizing it to, to create. I think that there's going to be some sort of men and machine for a number of decades in certain areas. But uh, I think that the machine, just like Eric Kurzweil said, the machine will surpass us. Now, there's a question from Sally Booth, who I'm sure she won't mind me saying is a trend forecaster and also um, studying for a PhD here with me at Leeds. And she said, um, as well as working out what's happening now, which is what you can do from your data, how, how can we predict what's going to happen in the future? So how can we measure trends? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So um, the work that I showed uh, in that very last slide is gearing towards that. So I, I could have shown very many other analytics on this, but um, say we looked at um, yellow over the past 30 years, and we can show the work that yellow has done. We can show its timeline. We can show its cyclicality. We can show that most designers uh, work with, actually most designers across all colors work with mid-range colors, not with the light ones, not with the dark ones. We can show how color go, how one color goes in, in conjunction with another. We can show, um, um, yeah, the emergence of new colors. So we have not yet completed the thinking even on what to model color behavior after. I, being very close to color forecasting myself, I know that uh, the, the way we do it as individuals is of course lacking any data at that scale. So the, the machine already is a whole lot more I'd say insightful from my work with the machine. I, I, I'd say that comment with, you know, respect to all the work that we do as individuals, because I'm I'm one of these individuals as well. So it's not like I I don't I don't know I don't yet belong only with the machine, but I can see that the machine gives me insights and and foresights that I'm unable to generate on my own. I I could have shown another. Um, let me let me see if I can quickly find it for you. Uh, another really interesting. Um, interesting visual that I always, 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 always like to show, which many years back, and I hope you can see my my notes here, and you can see this visual of uh, chroma and value with different colors. Can you see that? Just if you can confirm this to me. Yeah. Yeah, so many years back, we fed uh, the machine with our um, yellows, um, uh, oranges, and, and reds that were forecasted in industry. And what we could see is areas where there is a lot of white space and the white space, we could tell what are the colors underneath this white space, but these are the white spaces for the colors that have never been used. So not only can we talk about color forecasting and where color can go, we can also introduce to industry colors that have never been used. So uh, a whole new way to talk about color innovation, because the whole purpose of forecasting is also to bring new colors to market. Uh, we sit on top of 100 years of color. We know what was in market. We know what is in market. We know how these behave. So we can see, you know, what colors are kind of gearing up. 
Um, and we can also see what colors have ever been in market to then be able to unearth them or introduce them. And so the whole work of a color forecaster in that sense um, can shift. We can also say that um, you know, the timeline in fashion and the timeline in cars or homes is a little different and there is a lagging effect. So whatever something is introduced in Paris, we will take a little bit for it to come to towels or uh, to cars. And we can show that as a way of informing other industries on their color forecasting practice. And um, I had another thought that crossed and left. So just if it comes back, I'll, I'll add it to the conversation. But working with data gives you a whole lot more control, I'd say, on where we came from and how color behaves uh, in general, right? So that, that, that allows you to make, I think, more informed predictions. Wonderful. There's, there's one last question. I don't know how much you want to say about it, if anything, but it's from uh, Pewa Lei, who's asking about any, asking about processes like whether you use any any APIs or, or platforms or whether you want to disclose anything about about how you get this data. Sure. So the we are using APIs. Um, we ourselves have built our API, so it's easily accessible by others. So you know, if people want to do research with our work with our data, there is an option for that as well to open pieces of the API. Um, we access APIs when they're available. So the car industry, for instance, has some APIs that you can access, some free, some for uh, charge that you can access to get, say, imagery uh, of interior and exterior colors, as an example. Uh, so we've accessed that. Uh, the um, US Patent Office has an open API where you can go and, and check the trademarks. It's complicated to find, but there is a way to go about it. Um, there are APIs for birds and flowers. There's an API for color. Uh, not for color, for space, and so the the there are uh, there are there are aggregations of data out there that you can access, and that makes life a whole lot easier. And just accessing the data, uh, then you have to treat the data, which where is where your proprietary capability has to come in. So, uh, are you able to extract data from image? Are you able to extract data effectively from text? And most importantly, data by data, I mean color data, then classify. So to extract it is one dilemma, to classify it in the right color families uh, is another dilemma, and then structure it with the right variables so that you can more easily analyze it later and then visualize it effectively. So there's quite a number of steps in the process, um, all of which I had to learn. I was not born with that knowledge uh, far from, and I've never developed it in my career until recently. So there's a lot of learning, um, and the technology is advancing as we are advancing. So it becomes increasingly, I think, um, easier once you, once you know how to do it, it's becoming increasingly easier and there's a community that sits there that's more than uh, helpful, which is really great. Anat, you, you've stimulated, stimulated a lot of ideas and thoughts and I, I, there's a huge number of comments in the chat saying how much they enjoyed your talk. So it's, it's been Thank fantastically you. successful. So if, if we were live in a room now, which I wish we were in many ways, you'd, you'd get a huge round of applause. <laughs> but I would just give you a round of applause. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed the talk. I'm sure everyone else enjoyed it. Loads of great comments. Um, thank you so much for coming um, and giving this presentation. Um, yeah. We'll end the presentation now, but it will be has been recorded. It will go on YouTube, and um, I'll put the link in this chat when uh, when that's live. It should be it should be live in a few days. So uh, and thanks everyone else for coming as well. And uh, see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we Thank must you talk about much. things, by the way. We, 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 we're doing a lot of things in common, um, uh, though we're not That's working wonderful. on the same scale as you. We're, we're, we're so interested in what you're doing. Thank you okay. very, very much. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.